at Caltech. He received his bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Tehran University, Iran, and then pursued his graduate study in uh, Caltech and uh, finished his PhD at uh, Caltech at Aeronautics. Uh, after two years of, uh, as a senior scientist at uh, Jet Propulsion uh, Lab, uh, JPL, he joined the Faculty of Applied Mechanics and Engineering Science Departments at the uh, University of California, San Diego. He became a full professor of fluid mechanics in 92, and in January 93, he joined Caltech as a professor of engineering. Professor Gary's current research, <coughs> current research interests include bio-inspired engineering for the development of medical devices. His other active projects include the development of advanced 3D imaging system and nano and micro fluidics. His biomechanics works include the uh, studies of the human cardiovascular system and uh, physiological uh, machines. Professor Garib's honors and affiliations include Fellow of American Association of the Advancement of Science, Fellow of American Physical Society, Fellow of American Society of Mechanical Engineering, Distinguished Israel Pollock Lecture Chief Award, Sackler Scholar in Bioengineering, University of Tel Aviv, Watson Lecturer, Caltech, at 19, at, uh, on 1997 and 2002. Uh, editor, <coughs> Experiments in Fluids, Associate Editor, Journal of Fluid Engineering, Executive Committee Member, American Physical Society, Award for Excellence, Visualized Image, uh, Visualization Society of Japan, Award for Excellence, Visualized Image, 1995, Visualization Society of Japan, Low Visualization Award, American Physical Society. He received five new technology recognition awards from NASA in the fields of advanced laser imaging and nanotechnology. For his 3D imaging camera system, he has received R&D Magazine, Magazine's R&D 100 Innovation Award for one of the best invention of the year 2008. Professor Gary holds 173 publications in the current journal and 45 issued in U.S. patents. share some of the uh, recent uh, topics that, that this excites me about uh, um, my research and say basically uh, uh, systems around this why inspired design concept and uh, I'll uh, try to do my best and maybe get some of you guys excited. So um, uh, the first thing I would like to do is that make the distinction between biomimicking and bioinspiration, okay? Um, and you know from uh, uh, our attempt to, uh, to learn how to fly, that just mimicking uh, nature may not be the right way of approaching uh, uh, or achieving an objective, like in this case, flying. I've seen all those old movies that people try to flap and they fall off the cliffs. And uh, uh, basically, uh, we did not, uh, we could not uh, uh, come up with a flying machine until we appreciated that something very important that nature does and we don't. Um, first thing is that nature has materials that can be multifunctional. Okay? They have, uh, unfortunately, we do not have that privilege of having that kind of material. Uh, the um, second thing is that uh, in applying this material, nature uh, can separate functions, uh, uh, can put together separate functions under the same uh, 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 system. I'll give you an example. In this case, if you think of uh, uh, you know, uh, wings or muscles, the muscles uh, not only can generate uh, uh, force to have lift, also the force to generate thrust. So you do this 
both function the same machine, the same uh, thing. And did you just realize that? Because uh, the human power was not enough to import. But when we learn that, if you think of airplanes, modern airplanes, their wings, the wave function is generating lift. And the engine is generating thrust. So once we learn that we cannot do like birds, we separate the, the function, assign different you know, the, uh, assignments to them, then we now have something like 747 that is more efficient than any bird that you can imagine if you want to fly from LA to New York. Okay? Nature cannot be. So it's possible to be better than nature if you really learn how to um, basically and, and, uh, uh, learn the tricks that nature plays or cannot play. So um, for uh, this case, in this lecture, our uh, objective is to uh, come up with machines that you know, can help with uh, circulatory system, artificial heart, you know, the perivascular systems. How do we do that? Um, <coughs> the whole cardiovascular system is designed to uh, basically deliver um, uh, nutrients, uh, remove waste, uh, deliver oxygen. So everything is done through the circulation of the blood. And uh, like everything else uh, in nature, uh, when it comes to life, you have to deal with aquatic systems. In this case, uh, nature comes up with all kinds of different uh, tricks how to uh, circulate into it. And uh, this article, Nature by Stephen Vogel, is a very interesting one because it, it looks at the, um, um, say, systems that industrial uh, men uh, uh, basically uh, design and build and compares to a cool and the corollary in nature. Okay? And um, you can pick up uh, from a piston pump and find the equivalent of it, valve chambers, like the jellyfish, and so on and so forth. And the uh, concerned the objective nature has been very colorful in coming with systems that can circulate the vital fluid. The best one that we all familiar close to our heart is our heart. That is a system that um, Um, it's an, uh, uh, in general, I can think of it of uh, a two pump system in series with four valves. It gets uh, close to two billion times during the normal lifetime. It's a uh, very efficient, forgiving machine until you start abusing it. Okay. But, and past, you know, the 100 years of starting with Charles Lindbergh, another aeronautical engineer who built the first line heart machine. To modern, you know, the scientists and engineers and electronics, Edwards and all the companies around us, we always uh, wanted to mimic this machine, a uh, system that it can help sick people, you can take their heart and put this one inside. Well, <coughs> let me break the news today. There's no artificial heart machine that I would recommend to put for my model. Okay? It's not there. Why? Because we always try to mimic this machine looking at the static rather than the function. Okay. You just try to put two chambers here or just grow uh, tissue around this heart like this and try to do it, but ignore the function and how nature does it. Well, how do we do that? How should we approach it? <coughs> um, there are two statements I would like to make. First one is that um, uh, we will learn from nature's device by understanding how she manufactures them. So think about it. Instead of uh, trying to mimic the final design, try to think how nature got them. And what are the different stages that nature used in order to, to build a system like human heart? The other one is that we have to look at the evolutionary perspective on this, on this fact, in this case. Um, and then put it in the context of the genetic fact. What does that mean? No, um, it means that it's not just everything is in DNA, and if you have it and it's a started process, it's going to grow a heart, but also an environment that this thing grows into is important. Okay? And if you look at it, many diseases in a human, uh, say uh, heart valve diseases, it, it really starts from early stages in embryonic uh, phase. So where uh, you no know, system grows around the heart, you have blood flow, you have uh, environmental factors. So 
so it cannot ignore. You have to put it up top. Um, in this case, for uh, when we started to look at the uh, part of the model for us, we chose uh, Jupiterfish <coughs> as the biological model for many different reasons. First of all, is that it can grow uh, from long term inception to semi adult uh, in four or five years. That means from few cells, uh, in this case, the heart can become a full adult heart in four days, which is amazing. You can basically four days see how nature builds in front of your eyes. Um, and the also transgenic, and most of the time, this is transparent. Uh, it's also zipperfish is one of the first vertebrates that the, uh, the its DNA were fully sequenced. So we have a good library of stuff to look at. Issues are that you know this stage, embryonic stage, is very small. Okay, and the heart is even small. So the tools to study the heart, in this case, uh, they need to be really uh, uh, special and uh, highly um, Here's the um, <coughs> the uh, zipper fish. Um, it's. Uh, I hope you see the heart beating, and I hope you see the blood cells. That uh, this is the eye, and the zipper fish in this case is uh, captured in an agarose, uh, which is like a jello, uh, to put uh, nutrients here, so it keeps it alive, so it can do the experiments without fish moving around. And uh, then once you melt the agarose, it just not uh, all the way. The so, um, the, um, as I mentioned, in, even in, uh, after four or five days, that the whole part in this case, you can see that a few. Uh, but this is the uh, ventricle, this is the atrium, and these two are the, the tiny valves, uh, not more than uh, you know, four or five microns. And the whole part fits into human hair. So, for some of you that uh, look at the fluid mechanics uh, of a biological system, or fluid mechanics in general, if I tell you that I have a system that has the diameter of this one, the medium is um, blood, like water, five times more viscous, um, and uh, what do you think the Reynolds number is? The Reynolds number is the ratio of the kinematic forces to viscous forces. In this case, because it is small, and uh, the diameter basically is uh, in this case 75 micron, is the, the, the numerator, the number is very small, it's 0.01. So for some of you that know fluid mechanics, the number of less than one, that means everything moves slow, lots of shear. So for the first time when we started to look at this other microscope, uh, it was very interesting to see something quite different. So, um, this is actually in real time. It's all uh, Okay, so um, you can see that this is the ventricle. Uh, when it comes back, you will see. If, um, it basically shoots the blood cells so fast that you don't see them. It just basically like a strip. Okay, and for us, what's really amazing because it's such a small machine, it's so dynamic. And uh, because of the viscosity of the blood, and the dimension, so we suspected there are lots of shear in the walls, okay? So this this part, this chamber must have been working against enormous force in order to uh, sustain the circulation. But still this was too mature for us because it already has the chamber, it already has the valve, but it wasn't uh, it was still uh, uh, simple enough. So we said, okay, let's go back four more days. Uh, just you know, 24 hours after reception. The, this heart is nothing but a tube, exactly like something like this. Of course, the diameter is much smaller, around 50 micron. It, it's made up of about roughly 300 cells. And what you're seeing actually is the tag cells, the basic cardiomyocyte and the stem uh, cell state. <coughs> now, um, So what we had, we had this fish from inception for four days and watched and tagged, uh, uh, tagged all the cells and watched them as this heart went from the tube, uh, bulged like this, and then twisted and made the two chambers exactly what you saw.
saw in the movie. Okay? And um, basically, we went from 24 hours post fertilization down to 100 hours, where in between somewhere it pulled it out. So, what you saw at the beginning is actually a cube, if I show it again, that has no bags. But you saw it's moving. And it actually circulates blood. So it still is a heart, it's a pump. But if you think about it and compare, the tube without any valves, circulating blood, compared to the final stage that you have two chambers with valves that basically uh, guarantee your directional flow. In this case, you have just a tube that is squeezes at one end at this, and then uh, it pushes the blood going from one direction to another. So we were uh, kind of uh, interested in uh, understanding that how a um, uh, system which is, consists of a tube and few cells can uh, push the blood in one direction. Um, if you look at the, uh, you know, the standard textbooks, they tell you the mechanism is called first level. That means you, you take a tube like this, you squeeze it at one end, move in one direction, so whatever in front of it is pushed from that to, to that direction. Okay. So that means all the cells should sequentially contract in order to provide this you know, action. Well, if um, you're an engineer, you, you basically ask yourself, okay, if mechanism is this, then it has to follow a few rules. And the first rule is that the, um, the if the squeezing is from left to right, Flow also should be from left to right. This is simple and intuitive. And um, the next one is that the blood velocity cannot be faster than the wave velocity. Okay. So that's another very simple requirement. The third one is that cardiac output. That means the flow that comes out of this tube should depend on the frequency linear. If uh, I go one bit per minute uh, and then increase it to two bit per minute. The flow should stop. If I go trip it per minute, it should trip. So it has to increase linearly by with the uh, heart rate. Uh, well, we went actually measure the flow using the particle velocity. This is the average velocity versus heart rate for heart rate. It was peristaltic action, as I mentioned, that this heart uh, the cardiac flow should increase linearly with the heart rate. Okay. But what we saw was interesting is that actually it's not. It, has, it shows no signs of resonance. It seems that instead of <coughs> linearly increasing, it's, it prefers some frequencies. It has some preferred frequencies. Right? In this case, it's 1.8, 2.4, and sometimes it can go lower, sometimes it can So this clearly killed the uh, theory of uh, peristaltic action. And what was uh, the dilemma for us is that usually resonance is not something that we find in biological systems. Okay? It, it wasn't something that you know you see in the standard textbook. The other thing that we did was that, um, as I mentioned, we tagged and um, basically followed every cell during the different cycle. We can see that we could actually map the orbit that they move. And just from that action, we, we basically try to understand uh, which cells are moving together and which cells basically wait for some action to happen. So from beginning of the tube to end, if you uh, plot the delay, you will find out that actually um, few cells at the beginning of the tube, they all fit together. Okay? But the rest of it is follows with some time delay. Okay. Think of uh, a waterbed that you go from one end and you just do this. Okay, all the material under your hand they basically contract together. But then also you see the movement that will travel. Okay, but if you didn't know that your hand is doing this and look, looking from a distance, you think this is just a wave action and everything is the same. That's not actually. So a few cells up here, it seems they are all getting the order that you bit right now together. And the rest of the cells are just like a following the wave that this elastic material generates. So, well, it's interesting because it's not peristaltic anymore. Because the peristaltic, you know, should be sequential all the way from one end to another. It cannot have two cells. What was interesting, later on we found that these cells, 
become the pacemaker of the adult heart, like the SA nodes. Okay, when you build SA nodes, those are cells that the, the controller of your heart rate. They just pulse everything. So what is it if it's not peristaltic? So we came up with this theory that actually instead of being peristaltic like this, it's you have the uh, excitation of two cells and the waves are traveling and something happens at two ends. Because end of the heart tube, the materials are different. Imagine that you may have an uh, elastic tube here and they're connected to two glass rods. So very elastic here, very rigid at the end. So the waves that you're generating, that's the option of coming back. Okay? Just think about it. If it was an infinite tube, you generate a wave, you just travel, and you never come back. Or because of the same material. But if you put a different material here, and waves have to reflect. They call it impedance mismatch. And electrical engineers know that pretty well. And acoustical. So we went to the lab, and we said, let's model this. So we took a uh, rubber tube, to a, a, a uh, glass loop and use a, a shaver uh, vibrator like you know, those cells and started to just oscillate asymmetrically at one end. And you can see that beautifully start to pop. Okay? It wasn't peristaltic. I'm not doing this. All I'm generating the waves here, you can see the waves at the surface. And at certain frequency the reflection you know, caused that. You put it on the other end, so here is actually a, a more quantitative explanation. If you're actually if you're right in the middle, waves travel symmetrically, come back, cancel each other. Nothing happens. You move it to one end or the other end, you can have actually similar peaks that you saw in the embryonic part. Okay. This is even larger than embryonic part, in the thousands of times. But it shows exactly the same type of resonance on data. So it was interesting, you know, why? How? Well, those of you that have aeronautical or good mechanical background, they understand that there's something called char characteristic methods, or wave, wave reflection. If you have to send a wave to that wall, and I send it at right frequency, so the reflective wave and incoming wave interact constructively, they can create a huge expansion, act like a suction. And if the other end helps you to you know, destructively, that means squeezing, then you get double action. Right? So by tuning the frequency for a given material, you should be able to induce this in one action. Very simple. And uh, you can write the equations uh, and uh, you can solve it. To just show that this is a resonance, we did some um, pass-free transform. And you can see that this is where you have the maximum flow. You can see that that right frequency you have a resonance. So, okay, now we have a resonance system in a biological system that we could mimic outside the body of the fish with a simple uh, uh, process. And then you can go and study that further more. Uh, for those of you who know that if you have a resonance, that means you have minimum dissipation in the system, mechanical and electrical. So here, for example, we show the flow versus frequency. And here is the, actually the pressure versus flow, the PV loop. And you can see that the resonance at this frequency, the area in the loop is almost zero, which is the resonance. For non-resonance, here and here, you have a finite area. That means dissipation is fine. Conclusion, nature found a very efficient system to pump through less you know, effort it can pump more. It's even better than you know first all. So it, I mean nature is efficient, yes sometimes, but this one is a case that is very efficient. Well uh, none of you asked me well how did you change the heart rate? So let's go please feel free to ask questions by the way. Um, I want to just uh, explain to you how it is. Um, you remember that they kept the fish in the aggregates, okay, the material that they held. It. So if I add a little caffeine to the aggregates, the heart rate goes up. Okay? <laughs> if I change the temperature a little, high and down, up and down, I can control the heart rate. 
I can add different brush. I can control bring it down. So it's very nice that you can without changing the viscosity of the blood, but then you can change the heart rate and that's how we did the room to because this is important because later on I'm using it to address some different questions. Um, uh, it's just uh, this uh, uh, ultrasound image of the, the same latex tube. It shows that the point that you do this action, and this is the point that reflects. At the reflection point, you basically have the same diameter. And here you can see that how the uh, incoming and the uh, uh, reflected way we track. Uh, I have a better example of the video of the lab with the um, I apologize after you go So, <clears throat> To explain the mechanism again, you, um, you have to think of a, an action mechanism here that follows you know, pulsation or squeezing or uh, actuator that generates the waves. And uh, if you look at here, at the, if you have the right constructive interaction, the expansion here, it creates a suction that you need to pump. And this is actually a real flow, right at this end in that latex tube. And uh, this is at the moment, when the wave that's coming in this direction from left to right, and this is the boundary, it reflects on itself and creates this huge no opening. And it only happens at that band of frequency, not at all the frequencies, because you need to have the right interaction. And this is clearly shows that this uh, hypothesis is valid. We um, actually um, uh, use the characteristic methods and um, we showed that you know this. Um, if you give me the length, the material, the diameter, and the type of reflection you have, I can precisely predict the frequency and also the flow rate that uh, you will get. This is just one computation, and um, the blue line is the simulation, and the gray one is the experimental. And just simple uh, model shows that you get the peaks, and this is. Nothing really magic about this pumping mechanism. What was, you know, uh, I should say magic for us was that the nature arrived at such a, you know, elegant design for pumping at this early stage of the life. <coughs> um, we did all kind of uh, computational uh, modeling. Um, for some of you that are interested in energetics and the efficiency, this, this is very interesting. Um, yeah, you all, uh, I need to say that I had a control volume. I'm injecting energy through my pincher. In this case, for the pinchers with the cells that contract in. So you transfer energy from this machine to uh, this tube. <coughs> but it's dividing to two segments. One is basically uh, transfer to kinetic energy that goes through control volume. The other part translates into mechanical energy that goes to elastic wave of the body that enters this control body. So now you have kinetic energy that enters here, the kinetic energy goes outside, and then at some point meets the mechanical or elastic energy that travels through the tube surface. Okay. Now if these two cooperate at the right time, that means when the flow is creating the suction and mechanical uh, elastic energy is in the right phase, that means you just get a kick to the parcel of fluid that's here and push it out. So the kinetic energy of this part is larger than in. So it's, it's interesting because if you basically subtract this mechanical energy or elastic energy, you may think that I'm violating the first law, okay, which is not true. All it is that you have to add this energy across this one, and you can see that you no. Know, uh, uh, thermodynamics also proper. And we can show that at the right frequency and the, uh, the efficiency can be uh, pretty high. Now, one other thing, question? Yeah, just a question. Um, if you change the length of the tube, did you 
change your frequency? Wait, what the frequencies de uh, depend on? The frequency uh, for the pumping. Okay? Yes. Depends on you, which decides about the phase velocity of the wave and using, the frequency. You think the length of the tube? Length? And also that it's an eigenvalue problem. Yeah. It depends on the length of the tube. That's the most important. What about the diameter? Diameter? Like diameter? How many no, in there? Nothing. Okay. Because the wave velocity really depends on the material property. Um, now, Remember that in order to change the flow direction, I, I took the, the uh, uh, sorry, you, you picked the right one. Okay. That it has to be asymmetric. Okay, first of all, and uh, uh, at certain frequency, I had one direction. But what we found is later on is that if you expand the range of frequency, actually you can reverse the flow for the same reason because you can have the constructive interaction on the other hand. Right, and they say the left, right, and right. So you can stay at the same position and just change the frequency like the diamond, and you can change the flow direction. Like, as you can see here, you can go from positive to negative just by changing the frequency. And also the response time. You know, this is a plot that shows that it's pretty fast, and since we don't have time, I can go fast. Um, getting back to <laughs> this, uh, why nature chooses this. Obviously, in the peristaltic, it has to employ many cells and uh, make sure the information arrives at the right time in order to do this sequential action. Information is a very precious commodity for being distributed so loosely, especially in embryonic stages. You don't have the nerve system to you know, deliver this information. So again, it's, it's kind of intuitively the uh, uh, supports that it has to be like. Now, being, you know, Medified medical engineer, and you ask yourself, where is the application? Can I use this for something? The first question coming into your mind is that is this scaling? Can we make it larger, smaller? So, just um, uh, in our group, we um, built uh, a variety of this thing from large one to small down to almost the size of the zipper fish part, that is about 250 micro. Okay? And one of the nice things about this pump is it does not need. Uh, the priming. Okay, I can put it between two puddles of water and turn this on and start to suck from one into it because it works on air too. Okay, so you can put two phase flows. It also does not need to have complete pinching. Uh, you can change the frequency to higher frequencies and reduce the amplitude. Okay, so you can pump polymers, blood cells without damaging it uh, compared to pumps that. You have to have a blade or valve or you can make them in a planar form. You don't need to have you know circular uh, we uh, <coughs> build for example one that is a PDMS. Uh, it consists of many pumps and uh, they're driven by uh, either piezo or uh, magnetic you know actuators and you can have many of them on top of each other so uh, it, but since the principle does not depend on it is an axisymmetrical now, you can give a, a variety of options. Um, in terms of pressure and flow that they generate, it's uh, here it can say it's in a good company, uh, except the, the um, electroosmotic one that creates much higher pressure, um, is in a good company, it's a reasonable, uh, general, general reasonable hand. Um, in terms of efficiency, uh, although it uh, fits the uh, electroosmotic, uh, uh, in terms of dynamic efficiency of it, it's uh, all the published data in the literature. We find that uh, this is as we expected from the uh, financial picture that's quite efficient. Um, type of application that you are working on, one is for uh, uh, hydrocephalus. It's a disease of the uh, brain when you have uh, uh, basic excess fluid in the brain. In the, uh, uh, for the children, uh, uh, usually it causes the enlargement of the head because the skull is soft. In adult, it's more devastating because it actually shrinks the head, it shrinks the brain because the skull is pretty rigid because it makes the brain plastic. So it's very uh, um, uh, devastating disease. And um, the, the 
usual approaches that they could have found, and uh, then this valve into the clock, and also uh, uh, had many other problems that, so what we did that we uh, designed a pump that uh, can be used for actually control release of the um, liquid, the fluid from the brain. Uh, it's um, all this under conservation by one of the major manufacturers of uh, the shunts. Uh, the other application is um, for glaucoma, uh, where again a similar problem, uh, pressure in the aqueous in the eye goes up, damages the shunt channel, then there is no uh, release or relief of the pressure. As a result of that, the nerves are damaged. So again, there are medications or laser treatments but they all uh, have limited uh, or some side effects. Um, the idea was that um, we can put actually uh, shunts to permanent shunts like this, but they even do not you know, reduce the pressure enough. Say normal pressure is about 40 millimeters of mercury for a glaucoma patient is about 30. This shunts bring them down to maybe 20 minutes. The question here is that if you only set them, you are around 14. So we uh, have an SBIR from NIH that uh, we are working on putting this one inside the shrine. Now, uh, because it's efficient, uh, it's interesting because we can drive this one just from the light that goes into the eye. So this whole design includes a little uh, photovoltaic patch that can be implanted and the surface of the light the six millimeters by six millimeters can generate enough power to write this one to bring the pressure down to 14 minutes of um, Again, remember that any other pump will require high frequency blades or something that you know, too mechanical. In this case, uh, I can tell you how this works. It's, so this, this part is uh, uh, rubber material saturated with uh, ferromagnetic particles. And this uh, tiny coil, what it do is just basically uh, uh, modulating the field. So the wall of the tube is just oscillates because the field that it generates is oscillating. So there's no squeezing or uh, <coughs> Okay, so that was the pump part. Uh, but then uh, you may ask if this pump is so good, then why nature changes to a different kind of design? Uh, why can't we stay with this uh, you know, impedance pump as we call it? Well, as you recall that no matter what, I can put my hand and block in one end and there's no flow. Okay? Uh, so that's an extreme example. So at some point when the body of the fish, or the human, starts to evolve around this pump, which is a high flow, a high throughput pump, but not that high pressure pump. Okay? So, as the body grows around this pump, the resistance goes up. But at some point, it does not have enough power to maintain circulation. So what happens at that point? That was our first question. Is the flow of something is important to, for the growth of the bath? Because baths are the only mechanism that can pre prevent the flow that has been pushed to come back because of the resistance. So that was interesting. We can actually have a certain class of these zebra fish because basically they have no flow. And they can live for five, six days, the heart grows, very similar shape, but they have no back. No flow, no back. So if we ask this the flow master must be doing something. Okay, what is it that it does? So to understand that, let's look at this video. So this is about almost 96 uh, hours, almost not adult yet. Um, here is a ventricle, this is atrium, and you can see the, the volume of the pressure over there. And it's feeding, but if you watch the cells, they just go back and forth. They're not going anywhere. Okay, so, but there's no valve over there. Imagine if you had valve over there, every time you push forward, it preserved it, it won't come back. 
So it's a, it's a good time travel map. Okay. Um, so we said, okay, let's see what, what's happening here at that time that you start to see the map. Something must be happening. Something must be before. Well, it's, I'm sure for most of this uh, group, you are aware of that, you know, the shear stress as the friction force, not the pressure. The shear stress uh, is very important in some functions of the cell. Okay, you can show that, you know, if you have, um, in the work of Garcia, that, uh, many other people, that if you have flow over a certain cell, they align. So that means they, they feel the uh, force at the, at the wall. And those are basically felt by certain type of G-force. And there are many theories about this one, but almost everybody agrees that a, a shear on the wall of the cells, in this case endothelial, can basically excite the dew uh, protein, they, they sense the shear, they open up the calcium channel, and then after that, there's a whole host of chemistry happened in terms of tuning the, the, the cell walls or vessel walls to you know, the, uh, you know, toning the uh, whole system. So this, these are kind of things we knew even before starting this recently. The question we had was that, well, if I look at the point, that the area that this valve grows at, we saw flow going back and forth, uh, of course the cells here are going to have a different sensation or a different kind of force feeling than cells here. Okay? Because initially you have a tube, and then it creates a kink through the, say, after uh, 36 hours. And you can see if I have the flow at certain x, for example, the cubic centimeter per uh, millimeter per uh, uh, minute, whatever it is here, actual flow here is faster. Velocities are faster. So the shear sensing, the shear transfer from the blood to the cells are much higher here than there is here. So it can actually guess by the area. Right? Now, this is an area we call it the valve cushion. And we know that valves grow right here. And as you go to 72 hours, okay, this grows like a bump, but still it's not a valve. And then at 96 hours, about the time I mentioned, this beautiful lift has to start to grow up. Okay. So the question here is that uh, are these cells really, um, they sense the negative shear or negative back and forth? Is there any way to find out if, you know, um, Suppose that I had only one flow in one direction. Well, like in early stages. Would the cell sense it and tell you that I don't need a valve? And then if I go back and forth, they say, no, I need a valve. So uh, we have a paper, and uh, of course I refer you to it. We looked at uh, the, the usual suspect of certain genes that you look for. <coughs> um, but before I tell you uh, more about that, just tell also about the magnitude of the flows that we're dealing with. At 36 hours, the, the red here means the amount of time that we spend going backward, and black is going forward. So this is retrograde. At 72 hours, it's almost fixed, between this and of the main six, and then becomes, suddenly at some point becomes more negative. That means your balance starts low. <coughs> So we came up with this hypothesis that the bad formation has to do something with reverse shear stress. Okay? And uh, the, the challenge was to find how does it sell this reverse shear stress and how does it react. So we, we designed the following experiment. We found that as it increased the heart rate, okay, you can see that you have more negative shear in time, I tell you what. Because in lower heart rates, the cardiac cycle is longer, you only spend 24% of the time going back. At higher heart rate, you spend up to 40% of the time going back. So if I expose a heart to higher heart rate, so I should expect the heart not to grow earlier, if the sure stress was important. 
I hope you follow the line. I'm, I'm suspecting the going back and forth, this, this kind of rubbing back and forth, it starts some biological events that tells me grow the valve. So what I'm saying here is that I found that by increasing heart rate, I'm going back and forth much faster, spending more going back and forth. Therefore, I have to somehow initiate the signal that tells me grow a valve. Okay. So then I need to find a different way also to reducing the heart rate and keep the flow going always forward, then the heart would say, OK, I don't need a heart now. So I want to have two parameters in order to test. So changing the temperature, which would increase the heart rate. And then by adding lidocaine to the agarose, I can reduce the heart rate. So I can work one against each other. So here's the um, trick. We've discovered this gene, called KLF2A. It's a group of like genes. It's like G protein. What happens here is that we found, in this case, previously, before us, people knew that KLF2A is a gene that's sensitive to universal shape, but not in biological systems. Like this. So we found that, that at 36 hours, these black spots are all this KLF2A. They express themselves almost everywhere. At 48 hours, the shrinking to 58 is only at the cushion. So at the cushion, this gene expresses on itself. Whenever it sees high shear stress, reversal. So now you have a sensor, like the shear stress sensor in your experiment, uh, hot wire, a hot film. This gene acts exactly like a force sensor, but a very certain kind of force, the force that changes its direction. Not the force that's going forward, but back all the time. The force that, at the heart rate that you're dealing with, changes the direction. The minute you do that, the gene, this gene expresses itself. So we convince ourselves that this is very important for the growth of the valve, at least the time. So, so why don't we uh, have some gaming? So if this is a control. That means that naturally you see that the data will express right at the cushion, right? When you add lidocaine, which heart rate goes down, you're almost going to always positive. You don't need to have a heart valve in a, a functional heart valve. And you can see here, no expression of the gene. And you didn't have really a valve, it's just the body grows. And this is actually rigid, it doesn't move at all. Now, if you, for some reason, could kill that gene, OK? Or um, uh, I think I jumped ahead a little bit. Suppose that now I, uh, I, I showed you that by adding lidocaine, which is removing the retrograde, no regular valve. But if I increase the heart rate by increasing temperature, I rescue the valve. It starts to grow. Because now you have negative sure stuff. The, the slide that I started with was this one. Suppose that I kill that gene, so there's no gene to report to you that there is negative shear. Okay? No value. So even though you had negative shear, but since there was nothing to sense it and uh, tell you to uh, you know, start to go to that, no That's very interesting. You know, nature, I uh, know, in its own kind of way, you know, had all the sensors, had the location of the decreased element, but we didn't know what time. But that sensor allowed you to close the pit factor. So it, it's a very interesting uh, lesson that you know, epigenetic factors are very important. Just to give you an example, we were able to delay the hard part the valve growth by one day. You know, four days was the whole life, correct? For the becoming adult. Imagine you delayed it from London by just reducing the heart rate. As you increase the heart rate, you could actually promote the valve to grow one day earlier. So again, you can see it's a huge difference. You can just change the timing by just purely mechanical factors. Of course, they at some point uh, translate into biological signals through gene expression. But I had the control through the epigenetic factors. So just to conclude, um, 
even though all the information was in DNA that genetically we're, we're going to have developed, but the timing is really dependent on the genetics. And that's the timing is very important, especially uh, for mother. You can uh, you have heard that you know, shouldn't drink too much coffee. And, uh, or uh, a certain drug, because it directly influences the development of the heart in the embryonic stage. What is exactly relation is still we don't know, but at least now we have the clue that it's very important to keep those epigenetic factors under control in the uh, embryonic stage. <coughs> and with this, I will stop and uh, I would like to thank the group, and most of them, of course, I know. Uh, it wasn't just our group, also a group of professors that later who provided the, uh, the imaging uh, modality that we needed to do this study. And um, uh, also the original work of Ari Kovac and Michael Niven. <coughs> So um, the narrowing in the tube, uh, at what point does it start narrowing? Where the shear stress goes up and then the creation of the valve is induced. So how how is that narrowing created? Or where does that come from? Well, narrowing is very important because, uh, as I mentioned, if you have a fixed flow, okay, by narrowing it, you're increasing the intensity of the velocity. Yeah. And and from work of Garcia, we know that you need to go above 14 dime per centimeter square in order for genes to start to respond. So if you didn't have that narrowing, or every, or if the whole tube was that narrow, then you wouldn't have that selected location. Um, just for uh, your uh, uh, very good question. So what we're doing right now, uh, zipperfish, um, <coughs> I go back to <coughs> So uh, this is the heart, and there's a vessel that goes to the tail and comes back. Okay. So what we are doing right now, we are trying to actually grow a valve in the tail. Uh, and our technique is very simple. We just create a narrow. Okay? And, um, and we actually prove that uh, suddenly you start to see that the calyx do is less to express itself. Okay? Now, whether a valve is going to grow or not, that's a different story. But the point was that by providing a narrowing of the vessel using uh, PID, we, we made sure that the sure stress went above 14 diameter surface and gene expression is not in So is that, that narrowing is very crucial. But is it already there as the... Yeah, it's, uh, it's not already there. It, it, it evolves. Oh, the narrowing uh, evolves? In, uh, in the, say, normal growth. So you start with a tube. As I mentioned, that the location is basically genetically you know, predetermined. It's not something that we could. So the narrowing uh, basically shows up over there. And then the loop. Okay. It's the narrowing is not just uh, narrowing like this, but if you take a tube and twist it, what happens? At some point, it starts to narrow. Correct. That's exactly what happens. So the two ends of the tube starts to move like this. It, you follow my hands. Go like that. Okay. Imagine at this location, you start to narrow, and then go like this. It becomes the part. Okay. So before that, this twisting creates this narrow. That's where the valve cushion is or shown. Now, is that location optimized in any way? Sorry? Is that location optimized in any way? Um, is there a reason it's located where it is located? Or we don't that I don't, I, I don't have enough information to answer. Have you started looking at the possibility of using nanotubules? Kind of, um. um, it's a good suggestion, no. I was just wondering when you knock out the KLF2A, does that prevent foul generation indefinitely or just the way for a day because you were talking about healing it for No, that's indefinitely. 
So in that case, it's that's good. Because you're tied up to the plan. And in the other case, uh, yeah, just the right. Moving up the uh, animal kingdom a little bit. Does, does that gene play a role in human physiology? I mean, is it possibly as a parallel to the heart of the well, uh, yes, it's not in the embryonic stages of a human, nobody has mentioned it yet. Okay? But we know that in, uh, um, the gene expresses itself when you have the flow suppression and, and then on the side of aneurysm in the aerosol, people have observed it. So in adults, it actually has a reverse effect. Sure. Okay. So it looks like you have to achieve the same dispersion in the phase velocity. So, and do you know enough about the frequency dependent dispersion of that in the materials that you're working with to be able to predictably create that zone of uh, formation? Or is it well, for <coughs> materials that we know exactly the property, yes, the control. But for biological, we're growing actually some biological pump right now. We're absolutely right. It's, it's kind of random. It seems like that, if you don't master that, that's right. Yeah. Then you can grow your parts. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I've heard a little bit about it, but is retrograde uh, flow a big thing in heart disease? Uh, Does it play a role? They, they play a role in aneurysm, for example. I just mentioned in uh, different locations. Yes, but when we have flow separation in aneurysm, they have flow sense and all this diseases just pop up. Uh, you mentioned that, or you showed the video where when the mouse started to form, the retrograde uh, flow was caused by pumping on one side. So if the heart started just with the pacemaker cells on this side, why would the cells here just start pumping also? Okay, let me just go back to the center. So the, the one, the video you're referring to that they're doing the the, the pulsation you saw. And the question here is that uh, if one side is working, why the other side doesn't pump? Uh, am I, am oh, I, I, it just looks like both sides are pumping. Or is it just... Uh, it's not pumping. It's, no, it's just a reflection. It's just a reflection. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you, you think it's fun. No, it's only I mean, one wave is generated and what you see is just that action. But when you have the constriction, you know, it appears like the two kind of working like that. It's not like in, in reality, but uh, in most of the images that we saw, because of the imaging, that it actually is like this, you know. It just goes like this and then like this. Okay. It's not like, you know, uh, even human heart, it, it's not doing this. Human heart also goes like this. It's like, you know, the school in hell. But, you know, in textbooks, you always see on videos, they're going like this, it's just the cartoon is decided to make that. <laughs> no. Uh, I'll wait until the break. That's okay. Well, we you know that our body, you know, we often forget about the penis system. I was curious if there's a parallel here, and is it possible that more or less grow the president heart valve? But that's what you know, actually they're doing. You know, I mentioned this one, which is they're doing an advanced side. Okay, but uh, right now we are working with mice, you know, so we size the vessels in liquid and then throw our own uh, cells and then we put the heat and pray hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, not, not as hard as a mouse. No, but, but that, that's a fantastic point because uh, venous valves are tiny valves, everybody has several of them in the legs. And that's the mechanism that makes sure that your blood actually goes in one direction back to your heart. Right. So it, it becomes incompetent, it's a major disease for our aging population. But as of now, we don't have any mechanical valve that we can use to replace it. Okay, so it's a huge, huge uh, demand for it. So um, if somebody succeeds to grow this valve, then uh, that's a big issue. Is there an next slide? I was thinking if we, is this providing insight on like the effective development of heart when they sometimes have, you know, valve missing and things like that? 
Yeah, as I mentioned a little bit, your work point is on cardiology and very interesting. The origin of the Sparta physician in the dog, which is back to the embryonic stage. And actually, this is exactly most of the articles that were in the children's market in the embryonic stage. But the origin of the so in the normal developing embryo, how is that pregnancy dependence achieved? How do you get this to a cycle through multiple pregnancies on a regular basis? Or is that progressive rate? So one experiment that uh, other people have done, they haven't done, is that they look at the, uh, the cells, say, at 10 hours. 